Hello and welcome to another video. This is Lester Quinn. And today, I'm going to show you some techniques that I use to create a complexro style drop that sounds a little bit like this. Okay, so what you just listened to was actually the third drop in my recent track, Lavender Soundwave. And it's characterized by a very large and rather colorful palette of sounds. Uh, and so when we first approach the question, what is complextro, we have to first acknowledge what it is we're trying to describe. And so when I think about complextro style music, I think about music that is highly intricate, music that takes a single melody and it disperses it, it shares parts of its melody through uh, a wide variety of sounds. Right, so if we take a look here, this is the pattern that obviously we're focusing on, this one at the top here, and this pattern is a merged variant of of all of the individual patterns that make up most of what you're hearing. And I, I've taken the liberty to merge them together to make it easier to look at so you can visualize first how many sounds there actually are and second to kind of see what the the core melody looks like. Um, and so as I scroll through here we're just going to take a look at how this, these individual sounds are broken up first and foremost. And as we sort of explore and, and break this apart, I want to kind of show you two things. First, how I overcome the sort of writer's block that can arise when you try to create music like this. In other words, when you start to create very complex drop and you get two bars in and then you give up and erase everything. I have been there time and time again. Um, and the second thing I want to show you uh, is how you can actually create from that a coherent piece of music. Um, and so we're going to look at both things today. So the first thing at the top here, these are some percussive elements, uh, big rototoms and such, orchestral drums. Uh, forgive the lagging a bit of the screen. I don't have the best uh, processor or, or GPU, so the graphics are a little bit behind. Um, here we have a couple sounds here, a couple sounds here as I scroll down through, there's some more stuff, and then we get to the bottom and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on down here, a lot of different sounds. Uh, these yellow ones are citrus, some of these are GMS, I've got a transistor bass, I've got a poison, uh, morphine, and then a little bit of um, east-west piano in here, direct wave. Uh, if I go here, I've got some more sounds. These are 8-bit sounds using Harmer and the magical 8-bit plugin. So uh, there are 40, at least 40 different sounds that are playing through this drop. And so what we're going to do is kind of look at how this, this melody is composed and how it's built up. Now, we're not really going to have time to go through each and every individual sound in order to keep this video at a decent length. But that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to use this drop, this track, as a demonstration for how you can create any kind of complexra style drop. Okay, uh, so the first thing that I want to address, and I think that this is the number one reason why I and many people get uh, you could say demotivated or you come across this writer's block when you start to create something like this uh, and trash it. There are a lot of projects of mine where I have started creating a drop like this and after one or two bars I completely ditch it and move on to a new project. The number one um, culprit I find is impatience. Uh, to create music like this you have to have some degree of patience. 
Now, some of you out there might be savants and you'll be able to put something like this together in an hour. Um, but I would say it's a pretty safe bet that many of us will not, especially if you are creating a lot of your sounds from scratch like I've done here. Um, if I open up the project info, you'll see that the total time I've spent on this project, and this number is a little bit off because the FL Studio's time counter isn't 100% accurate, but it, it nears around 40 hours. Out of those 40 hours, I can guarantee you about 10 of them were probably spent right here in this drop. The rest of this track is not nearly as complex by comparison. If you take a look just at the rest of this playlist, there really isn't a whole lot going on in the rest of this piece. A lot of that time is centered right here on this drop. It took a lot of time to create this. And that all started with sound design and sound selection. And that's the first thing I want to go over. I'm going to play for you just this pattern and just the individual elements that are taking place here. And I want you to focus on the individual sounds that I have chosen. And I'm just going to make sure that this gross beat is not active. Okay. And I want you to, to listen to the individual sounds. It's going to be uh, a little tricky to pull every single one apart, but the one of the things that I think characterizes this type of music is that you can pull every sound apart because it's all quite distinct. Notice how there's a lot of sections in here where some sounds have just one little blip or one tiny piece of the melody. Uh, and often those are isolated from the rest of the melody. So, in theory, you should actually be able to pull out every single sound that occurs. Now, you won't be able to the first time you hear it, probably. But, but um, if you had, for example, your project file like this, as you listen to it to perfect it, um, it should sound very clean. So, let's listen to this. Okay, so feel free to rewind and listen to that again if you'd like to uh, think about it once more before we dive in. So the first thing you'll notice is that by itself it actually doesn't sound super clean. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of reverb. There's a lot of stereo information happening. There's a lot going on after the notes let off. A lot of release, if you will. And so one of the initial techniques that I use that I want to first highlight is the use of volume automation clips like this one here um, that sort of mute that release when the next section plays. Now the reason that I use reverb in a lot of these sounds is to give it, again, more stereo information, more depth, to create an atmosphere around that sound that doesn't quite sound the same when it is completely dry. I didn't want a completely dry signal. However, in order to keep it sounding very clean, you have to be very careful to, to not allow the sounds to overlap one another too much, right? Um, it's like, like, think of it like coloring a picture. If you are working with 40 different colors and you color outside the lines all too often, the result is going to be uh, an, a very abstract image, an image that's very difficult to read, where you can't really separate all the individual colors. You can't tell them all apart. Whereas if you stay inside the lines of the picture that you're coloring, the end result is a very clear, a very sharp image that you are able to discern uh, with direct scrutiny. And so that's how I like to think about Complextra music, you are basically 
tr painting a picture or coloring a picture, if you will. And you have to try and stay inside the lines as much as possible. The lines being each individual beat uh, or section where that sound is playing. So, for example, take a look at, um, I'm just trying to find some volume envelopes here. This volume envelope is for the basses. Notice how every time the bass plays, I mute it afterwards so that it doesn't carry over to whatever sound plays next. Right here, I have uh, a crash cymbal envelope. This is very important. The crash cymbal has a very large release, and I'm going to play that for you so you can hear it. Uh, let's play this here. It has a very long reverb, and this is good in the sense that, at least for earlier parts of this track, uh, that makes it sound more like a cymbal, right? You, you need that long tail at the end there. Uh, but in this instance, we need to cut that loose a bit in order to accentuate or highlight the, the actual melodic portions of this track that otherwise would be muddied or glossed over. So what I'm going to do is play this without this. So you can kind of hear what it sounds like in practice. And I have left some of these other sound effects active because you're basically going to listen to this, th this drop without all the melodic information. Notice how clean that sounded. The reason is because of the volume envelopes. You'll notice that in a lot of the individual sections, I would cut the volume out in order to bring attention to, for example, this reverse effect here. Um, and another thing that I do is with a lot of these effects, I don't put any reverb at all. So take a look at this sound. This is a, a laser effect sound. There's nothing that happens after that effect is done. And so like here, what I've done is I've actually cut it so that there is absolutely no overlap, right? So if I play this again, you can very clearly hear this sound, which normally would have a slight tail here at the end, but I cut this sound also, see? There's a little little tail here that would overlap with the next sound, but I cut I cut it right when the next sound begins in order to keep it sounding again within the lines. We're trying to stay within the lines here as we color. Then you have this, which actually doesn't need any cutting because it doesn't overlap at all. Uh, there's this sound. So you notice there's a lot of um, chip tune elements to these sound effects that I use. Uh, and these are sort of treated as fills, if you were. Um, if you noticed, when we listened to this melodic portion, there were a lot of gaps, sections where nothing was playing. That's where a lot of these individual sound effects come into play. And so I've kind of created two different drops here and then combined them together. Uh, one of which focused on these little sound effects, the individual fills, and then the other that came from the melodic information. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There is no single way to create a piece of music like this. Um, but the method that I used in this track was I first selected a number of sounds that were very similar. And if you notice, one thing that characterizes all of these sounds, right? If you had to choose um, one thing, one word or descriptor uh, that you would say all of these sounds share, what's, what's a word would you use to describe them? That's the question you have to ask yourself before you create a piece of music like this. You have to go into it knowing that. Because if you do not have some sense of coherency 
in your music, it's not really going to sound like anything. It's, it's just going to be noise. Uh, it may still have some rhythm, but without a foundation to the particular tone that you're going for, whether it's light, whether it's dark, um, whether it's colorful, melodic, uh, or if it's more bass focused, you need a something to ground everything together. And so in this track, for example, I've chosen a particular palette of sounds that are very bright. Uh, and that's what I would use to describe every sound that occurs through here is the word bright. Every sound is bright. Every sound is melodic. There is um, a melodic nature. You could create a melody with any of these sounds. Uh, and so I highlight that as a very important thing to think about when you create music like this. Because, at least from my experience, I've noticed that if I try and just throw some random sounds together, uh, sometimes you may get a result that's quite nice. But other times, you may get something that just sounds very out of place. There's not really a, a uh, musical... There's not really a musical coherency to it. Um, and the reason for that, I, I think, has a lot to do with the mood or particular tone of the sounds that you use. A lot of these sounds, even though they're very different, they're also quite similar. If we take a look, for example, at this sound. This is Fatso. Okay? A very basic kind of sound. Okay, then we take a look at this default sound. I utilize slides a lot with this particular sound. This is kind of a weird sound. You'll notice it has kind of a, a distorted square here, and then a distorted sort of sign-ish thing here, because of how, you'll notice, I add some additional harmonics here at the end of this. This is what I use to create uh, a lot of um, the higher sections of this melody, which I layer on top of the bass. So here's one of the bass sounds. Okay. Uh, then I've got uh, a lead synth. This was a synth by Adam uh, something. Some nice lead this is. Okay, and then I have a transistor bass sound. This is a very acid kind of sound there. And just some things like that. Uh, take a look. Hang on, I'm trying to find a particular envelope in here. Um, okay, right here. Take a look at what is happening here with these. So if I open up this, now this is a patcher, and I believe I made this inspired from a video that Seamless made on one of his little bass videos. Uh, and I'm going to play just this section, and I want you to focus on all of the different uh, automations that are occurring here, because there aren't that many. Um... So the reason that I abruptly drew attention to this is because what we can do with automating or modulating certain aspects of these sounds is to make it sound like there is more going on than there really is. This is a technique that I also utilize thanks to Gross Beat. And you saw me use it a little bit earlier, but I want to look at it a little bit more in depth as to what exactly it does. Gross Beat allows some aspects of this to be possible um, by usage of uh, glitching and uh, sort of turntable turn kind of effects that you get here. Um, and so 
what I've done is I've just selected this preset complex 5 and then I automate the time knob and I just automate it from either 1 or 100 percent and so right at the beginning for example without grow speed it sounds like this right but with grow speed notice how it's kind of a backwards effect it sounds like this okay um, I also utilize it here right here without gross beat it sounds like this another sort of slide there and then with gross beat it sounds like this and what's also what it's also affecting is this laser effect that you sort of hear in the background uh, and that kind of stutters it a little bit it kind of sounds like this and so what this effect that you're looking at actually does is it sort of offsets the notes. See, so instead of playing it uh, straight away like this, it offsets the notes a little bit. So I put this back. Uh, and I use this again over here, right at this section. Uh, and this is a particularly interesting effect. I created this randomly, but I want you to hear how it sort of adds to the melody that's occurring here. I'm going to start playing it here in this yellow section, This uh, starting it here at bar uh, 146. Listen to how gross beat sort of changes that melody. <laughs> When I created the second part of this, starting here, I actually did so complementing the effect that Gross Beat gave to this little uh, section here. If I play it without Gross Beat, it has a very different sound. I also want to draw attention to this subtle but uh, effective section right here at the end. Notice how at the very end of this bar, there is a backwards effect that mimics what this sound does in the next beat. Um, listen to that. Now it's very subtle, but what I'm going to do here is take a look in this gross beat here. And if you notice, there's a curve. There's some tension on this curve right at the end. This is a turntable reverse effect. If I remove it, so for example, if I do this, you'll notice that it's completely gone when I play this, and the transition here is a little bit more abrupt. So what this does is it creates a very subtle but effective reverse effect that allows the transition to this next section to remain clean and very quick, uh, but still smooth. And we do the same thing with an actual reverse effect next, so I'll just play this a little bit longer. Okay, so uh, effects are a huge part of how I create uh, these types of drops. Grow speed is especially really neat because you can play, like if I just select a different one of these little... Um, Let's say, let's select this one. If I just select a different preset, I'm already getting some different sounds. Okay, so some of them may not sound as good, but you get the idea. You, uh, I, I would be lying if I said that I didn't mold some of this around the particular preset that I chose. Um, and I mean, you don't have to select presets, you can very well make your own. I don't know if I edited this in any way before I added it, but you know, if you wanted, for example, to have a, another slide effect here, you could do that and it would sound like this. <laughs> Or I could do this. Or I could do, if I wanted to have 
some bouncing going on. So you can create a lot of really neat effects with Gross Beat, and I use Gross Beat very liberally in some other tracks. Here you notice I use it a little bit more sparingly just to add some interest to some of these different sections here. Now I particularly like to use it at the start of some of these bars, um, except for here I think it has a really nice effect going into with that, that sort of stutter going into smooth backwards uh, effect there. Um, I don't really know any better way to describe it. And then uh, I use a lot of sort of chiptune effects to enhance what is going on here. If I look at some of these other things, uh, I do want to kind of look at some of the notation in here. And I want you to think about how the progression of this melody, and I'm going to go back to uh, just looking at the pattern here, uh, because I think that there is a misconception about complex drum music in that you focus a lot on the sound design, which you do, but then I feel like sometimes the melodic aspect of that, the composition aspect, can get neglected as a result of focusing so much on the sound, focusing so much on the colors that you're using rather than the picture you're creating, if that makes sense, if that sort of analogy fits. Um, and so we also want to be careful to focus on creating a melody that uh, agrees with the sounds that we've chosen. And so I choose a very upbeat melody here. Now, one technique that you can use and that I sometimes use, I don't think I used it in this track, or actually, I, I kind of did. This track was weird because when I created this drop, I already actually had most of the rest of the track made. So what I actually did was in a lot of sections, I would take different melodies. So for example, if we look at, if I can find, so like this melody, I don't know what this is. Let's play this. Okay, that's a bad example. But like I would pick uh, some melodies in here. Um, or, or maybe this. I'm trying to find something that actually makes sense. Okay, so this is a better example. So like maybe I would take like a chunk of this and I would just pull out like um, the first bar or so. I'd pull this out and stick it in a drop somewhere. And that's actually what happened at some point in here. I think that there is a section that is like that somewhere in here. I don't know where it would be. It would be a pain in the ass to try and find at this point. Um, but th I think that's how a lot of this particular drop came together is I would just pull sections of other parts of the track because I already had most of my sounds picked out by this point. And I would just create uh, notations that, um, so like here, for example, I created uh, a chord, but I separated the chord into different sounds. So let's play just this section here. Wait, I'm going to just expand that out a little bit. So there's a chord at play. Now there's no real, I, I, I guess, method that I use to, to figure out which sounds I wanted to do where, um, other than experimentation. So I found that this sound complemented particularly well with this sound, since they're both a little bit um, subtler. And then I have this sound, a vibraphone, which I think goes really well with um, that morphine sound, sort of guitar thing. And then I have this. So you notice these are a lot subtler than some of the other sounds I've chosen that are quite a bit harsher. Um, and then here, I have a harsher sound, a sharp knife is what I call it, because it's a lot, it's a bit of a harsher sound. And I can still keep a vibraphone in there. And then I have this sound, which we looked at a little earlier, I think. So you'll notice I sort of pair harsh sounds with harsh sounds, subtler sounds with subtler sounds. Um, this isn't foolproof, and I think that there are a lot of exceptions to that. Um, but when I'm creating chords, for example, I want to create, I, I want every note in that chord to be audible. 
And so I want to create it with a palette of sounds that are a little bit similar, but that you can still tell are very different. And what that does is it creates a really nice fluent texture that in your final piece merges well with some of the surrounding sounds, especially when there are ab abrupt changes in those sounds. So for example, when we went from the subtle to the extreme, um, or when we went from the, the softer sounds to the sharper sounds, you could say. Um, that, what that does, it, it's kind of the same way if you're painting a picture and you have a very light color right next to a very dark color. It makes the picture a little bit more, a little bit sharper, a little bit clear, more clear. It's the same thing in complextra music. So in a lot of cases here, when I'm taking my sharp sounds, like this default sound here that's routed to 57, I break it up in some of these fills with softer sounds to, uh, and what that does is it actually makes it sound cleaner because it separates the sounds. That's what you're doing is you're slicing the melody up and you're separating each of these individual sounds so that uh, the best part, so that you can hear each individual aspect of it. Um, and you wouldn't really be able to do that as well if every single one of your sounds was super sharp, right? Or if every single one of your sounds was just a variant of a saw wave, you know? Um, although I guess by additive definition, every sound is a variation of a sound wave, but that's besides the point here. Um, so hopefully you can sort of uh, synthesize a little bit of what I've explained. Uh, you can see I also use some risers in here, but these are mostly added at the very end. As far as when it comes to arranging, uh, sometimes what it's helpful to do, I think, is to create the melody that you want to make in a single sound first. And this is how I'm going to kind of end this video, because this is actually something that I've done here, for example. Oh, I don't know what I just did there. Sometimes what it's helpful to do is to create a bass melody like this, and, or it would have looked more complete than this. But sometimes what you do is you create a bass melody and then you can actually use one of the tools in FL Studio. If you go to select and you click select more at random, it selects some random notes. And one thing that you can do to start to play with this is cut those notes and put them in a, another sound. So if I take those and I put them inside of something else, let's say I put it in this groove bitch here, and now I have a melody, now this won't sound good, um, I don't think, yeah, um, I really just did that to kind of show you, but what you can do is you can create a melody and you can select some random notes, pull those notes out, put them in another sound, and then from those, do the exact same thing, so these are the cut notes, so now I can select more at random again, and just some more random notes, cut those out, put those in another sound, so you can see how this sort of continues. And in minutes, you can have a very interesting drop, and then you can sort of tweak it from there, and that's actually, I think, how a lot of this drop came together, is I mentioned that I, pull, I pulled together a lot of individual sounds from different sections in this track, and I just pasted them together and uh, tweaked them a bit to make it sound a little bit more coherent, added some chiptune effects on top to bolster some of these gaps that are in here, and voila! Complextro music isn't difficult, I don't think. It just requires a little bit of patience and a little bit of understanding of what you want to create before you go and create it. But by no means do you need a plan, right? You just need an idea. Like when you're coloring a picture, you don't have to know exactly how you want to color it, the colors that you want to use. You don't have to know exactly that, but you do have to have an idea of what you want it to look like in the end. And with that, I would say, um, you know, have fun with it. Complextro music is supposed to be very fun, I think, and it is very fun to make, as long as you don't let the technical aspect of it hinder your creativity. There are some very easy ways for you to very quickly compose something that sounds and feels very fun. And I hope that with some of what I've said today, you are able to, uh, to acknowledge 
some different approaches that you can take with this kind of music. Uh, and hopefully it can help you, as it helped me, overcome some of the writer's block that can otherwise be associated with trying to make stuff like this. So with that, I would say happy composing, and uh, if you have any more questions, please let me know. Again, I'm going to do more videos like this, so uh, if there's anything specific you'd like to know uh, based on something that maybe you've heard in my music, please let me know. Otherwise, have a wonderful day, and I will see you again soon.